All right. We finished up last time with talking about. Um, well, what did we finish up last time talking about? We're in Acts chapter five. Yeah, and we had just talked about Christ as the cornerstone, and also the hand of Christ reaching out to heal people in verse um, thirty. Or the hand of God, while thou stretchest out thy hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of thy holy servant Jesus. And remember, we talked about that, that whose hand is it that's actually healing people? Who's going around healing people? Yeah, and, and the apostles. Well, how do we deal with both of those issues? They say it's God healing, but they're the ones going around telling people to stand up. Doing it What's that? Doing it How do you do it through Christ? What do you mean by that? Or Christ is doing it through them. Maybe it's a little better way of looking at it. Yeah. Come on, give me some more. An extremely important point. Verse, um, verse thirty. We, looked at, we saw that again, uh, that was chapter 4, verse 30, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 30. We saw that in chapter 3 also, verse 12. Chapter 5, chapter 5, it's faith, right? Look at chapter 3, verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power piety we made him walk? Okay. What's going on here? What's taking place in the lives of these men that is, that is uh, extraordinary? The Holy, the Holy Spirit is working through them. The Holy Spirit is assimilating them into Christ as his body. And they become an extension of him because they live in his name. Exactly. Exactly. That's it. Exactly. This is the key to understanding the Catholic faith. I say this in every talk I give almost, right, Carrie? If you understand this point, everything else will be understood. Okay? Whenever you have a question about what the church teaches, apply this to it. And suddenly you can start to grasp the truth beyond. You don't have to read big things of theology. It's all about this. Participation in the life of God. It was the, God's plan in the beginning, and it's taking place now in Jesus Christ. Okay, absolutely essential. We talked about in Acts how there's a whole background here about the temple going on. And St. Peter, as he was arrested and he was giving his defense in front of the, the, the authorities, in, in chapter 4, verse 11 said, This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, but which has become the head of the corner. And we talked about a little bit about that last time. And what was that? What did I say about that? What's important about that verse? Which means it's going to fall. Okay, there's this whole background of prophecy taking place in Acts about 70 AD, about the coming destruction of the temple and, and Jerusalem as a whole. And along with that, what else is important? Not only the negative. But what's going to happen with this cornerstone, Nina? Yeah, or a new, a new house or a new building or whatever. These words and these ideas all of a sudden start to blend together as we're going to see. Temple, house of God, kingdom of God, church. All of these things are going to start to blend together for us into something completely new. <laughs> And the apostles are trying to explain what's taking place. Okay? We see in verse, we left off chapter 5, verse 11. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. It's the first time in Acts that we hear of the church. And it's an established thing. It's taken for granted that we know what it is. Well, what is it? What is the church? Is, is this the first occurrence of that word? Yeah, in Acts. Okay. Um, in Greek, does anyone know what the Greek word is? Ecclesia. Yeah, ecclesia or ecclesia in, in Latin. Transliterating it. 
Okay? Um, well, what does it mean? Those that are called out. Yeah. You want to teach the class, Joseph? <laughs> yeah, from X, we all know that, right? X out of or from, right? Like an exit, right? And kaleo, version of that, to call out or to call from. Those who are called out of, if you will. Okay? It's not simply something unique to the, to the New Testament. It was used in the Old Testament to denote the assembly of Israel. The calling out of the people. When, when Israel was at Sinai, God said, Assemble the people before the mountain that I may make a covenant with them. Continually throughout the Old Testament, this assembly of Israel takes place. And when, it's, when the Old Testament is translated into the Greek, that's the Greek word we come up with. Okay, so it's not something particularly new, a new concept to the New Testament. Okay, it's the assembly of Israel. What's interesting is that I was just talking to the RCIA candidates about this. That today we have this concept in 2007 of the church as this institution. Well, it is an institution in the sense it's been instituted by Christ, but we think about it as an institution like AT&T, which is a collection of buildings, and yeah, there's some employees there, and they got a bunch of money in the bank, and it's almost like it's a hard, inhuman thing. Okay? But when you understand the Old Testament references to the assembly of Israel, all of a sudden we understand when we're talking about the church, we're talking about people. We're talking about the assembly of Israel in the Old Testament, which is now being assembled by the will of God in the New Testament. Okay? All the while in Acts, as we're talking about this church, we're also talking about the temple in the house of God. You remember, what's, what's the t- one time in our Lord's life that sticks in your, your memory about when he talked about the church? Oh, the Petrine text? Yeah, right? Matthew 16, 18. And what, is, what does our Lord say? What's the whole conversation about? You remember, we don't have to turn there, but you'll remember it when... Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And, and, they, and they say, well, some say Elijah and some say the prophet. He says, yeah, but who do you say that I am? And Peter stands up and says, you are the Christ. You are the king. And he says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly father. And for my part, I declare that you are the rock. And upon this rock, I will do what? Build my Ecclesia, my assembly of Israel. And notice he's drawing together two images. He's going to build a building, but that building is going to be built out of people. Okay? He's using the words of an architect or someone building something. Okay? As a, as a side note to that, to that point, the king in Israel is to be the son of David. The new Solomon. Remember, Solomon built the temple. And so they looked for the Messiah to come to rebuild the temple and to free Israel from the oppression of foreign nations. Okay? So there's this images going on that all of a sudden our Lord takes what's taking place with the temple and as the king says, I'm going to build a new house and it's going to be built out of the assembly of Israel, those who are called out from the peoples by the will of God. Turn real quick to 1 Peter, the epistle of 1 Peter. You see this brought together very nicely. First, if you go to the book of Revelation and work your way backwards, that's the easiest. Okay, because you got Revelation, you got all the smaller epistles, and you'll see Peter right in there. Yes, you do. First Peter chapter two. Don't start reading yet. All right, if you're not there yet, look on with the neighbor. Go ahead, Carrie. Verse one through ten. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn. 
for in the infants long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. Notice that's the same text that was being quoted back there in Acts, right? The stone which the builders rejected. Go ahead, Karen. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in the scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious, but for those that, who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Okay, remember what our Lord said in the Gospel of John. Some of you are in the Gospel of John Bible study with me. When he was talking to this Samaritan woman, she says, you say that, that worship should take place in Jerusalem, and we say here on this mountain. And what does Jesus say back to her? You remember? He says, there's a time coming when people will not neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, for they will worship in spirit and in truth. The house of God, the assembly of Israel, the temple, have been brought together in Jesus Christ. Not only is the law now incarnate in man, in the person of Jesus, the will of God taking on flesh, but the whole created order now is coming alive. No longer is the temple dead stones like the Ten Commandments was written on a dead stone. Now the temple has been enfleshed in the hearts of the believers. And we have become, in our hearts, the place where the true worship takes place. All of creation has been incarnated in Christ. Okay? I have a question. Yeah. Um, could, could you, could, at that time, could you convert to Judaism? Or did you have to have been born? No, we're going to find out. We haven't actually seen it, but we'll see again people called proselytes. And those are non-Jews who converted, were circumcised, and their existence was still very interesting. They weren't really part of the chosen people, but they were following the true religion. Okay, And so we see that with the Ethiopian unit coming up. Here's a guy coming from Ethiopia, a long ways away. And he's a follower of, of Judaism. And yet, he's still not a Jew. Okay, That's going to become a big issue. Because that issue of how you're incorporated into the family of God is going to be uh, reinterpreted or is going to become an issue that's critical to the early church. What do we do with Gentiles as we go out to the Samaritans and we go out beyond them? What do we do with these people? Can they now be incorporated into the body of Christ, into the church, or not? And that's going to become the main issue in Acts. It's going to be a real dividing point. There's going to be some argument over it. Do you, yeah. think, do you think the issue was that they didn't think they could be incorporated into the body of Christ? Or did they need to become Jews in order to do it? Did they need to be circumcised? Because you see through right. the Old Testament, allowance is made for people coming to Judaism from, right. I mean... Yeah, but, uh, the yeah. There's there's definitely that issue of how to deal with them, but there's also the issue of how closely they can really be identified as God's chosen people. Can can an Ethiopian eunuch be one of God's chosen people or not? Right. I guess what yeah. I was thinking is the the temple in Jerusalem was the temple. I mean, when 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 I went to Jerusalem this last summer, they kept saying, "Oh, well, you know, when it was destroyed." The, 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 it, was, it, was, it was such a big deal because it was the temple right. and everybody had to come to the temple right. and 
whereas Christ was like, no, our church is, could be could be anywhere. You know, it could be in the Rome, and it could be in Ethiopia, and it could be you know in Spain, and it could be in, in Corinth, because it wasn't it wasn't connected to a building. Yeah, you know, but here's 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 a key thing that we want to draw away from. When we say the word church, what are we talking about? Are we talking about that building over there? Right. And we're not. We're talking about the body of Christ, which worships fittingly in buildings because we're human beings. And yet, the true worship is not because we're standing in the building, but it's because the hearts of the believers have been united to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which offers to the Father the perfect act of thanksgiving. That's where the true worship is taking place, right? So it's not a matter of whether it's the cathedral in Spain or we can build our temples all over the place. It's that the temple, the church of God, has now come alive. And all of those things associated with it in the Old Testament now are true in the New Testament in the people following God or following Jesus Christ, okay? Yes? Uh, you can tell me to forget this together. No, 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 go ahead. This is a, a political problem of today. Uh-huh. With all of this going on and the chosen people now being brought out beyond the Jews, mm-hmm. what about Israel today? What about Israel? Today. What do you guys think? What's implicit? What about Israel? Are you, oh, you mean about the state of Israel? Is it essential? Oh, is it something I'm we should be? About particularly the, uh, I guess the Protestants. Yes, uh, that's true. Who are out there saying, oh, Israel's going to have this, that. Oh, yeah, all these things have to be restored. There's a whole movement. With us, though. Yeah, there was a whole movement, and we were just dealing with this the other night with one of the gentlemen that was here. And I don't know if you guys noticed, I cut a guy off at the end, and I wouldn't let him talk because he was trying to evangelize from a particular point of view that's saying, we got to build the temple again, we got to start the sacrifices all over again, we got to get the red heifer, and they're trying, there's like people breeding, trying to get red heifers again for the sacrifice in the temple, and they're the, trying to restore the Levitical priesthood, and all this craziness that we, got, we, we abandoned the, the old ways. And my answer, uh, without dealing with the political issue of the state of Israel, and it's not my place to do that, is to say that for the early church and for us today, today true Israel is the one, is the, those people who follow God in everything he gives. When someone abandoned Moses, they cut themselves off from Israel. Israel was the house of God, the place where God and man became united again. Jesus Christ is the fullness of the revelation. In a sense, you could say, he's, well, he's the final Moses. And when people say no to him, they cut themselves off from Israel. For the early church, tr- the true Israel was still alive and well in the church because they had received the, the one sent from God. Jesus Christ, and they were following him. And so they saw themselves as the true fulfillment of what was taking place before. They were just kept walking along the way. That's why we're going to do this study about Old Testament feasts and New Testament feasts, because they were very cautious that they didn't just stop doing everything. They saw what they were doing as the fulfillment of what was taking place before. As we're going to see in a few minutes, they asked themselves, what was circumcision all about? We want to do what it was really about. We want to be circumcised in the true way. And the issue is going to come up, how do you do that? How does God really want us to be circumcised? What was circumcision all about anyways? Okay. Hi, Cynthia. How are you doing? <laughs> yes, Edwin. I, if I understand her question, maybe I don't. Is she talking about the remnant that... The Apostle Paul talks about the Romans. Is that, is that are you talking about the state of Israel or are you talking about the, the religious entity of the Old Testament Israel? I'm talking about partially, I think. I mean, I'm not going to get sure uh-huh. because I'm confused about the whole thing. Right. To that one. Yeah. That's it. Okay, I'll tell you what. Let me just cut you off there because I'm happy to talk about that, but not in this, like, okay. we can afterwards, if we want to stay around and talk about that, we can talk about that because there's all sorts of New Testament information that we have. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, afterwards we can sit down and chat if you want, okay? Um, all right, let's get back to the text because we're way out of, uh, we're, we got to get going. Verse 12, chapter 5, verse 12. Acts, Acts, Acts chapter 5, verse 12. Nina, go ahead. Chapter 5, verse 12 through verse 16. Many signs and wonders were done among the people at the hands of the apostles. They were all together in Solomon's heart and portico. None of the others dared to join them, but the people have seen them. Yet more than ever, believers in the Lord, great numbers of men and women, were added to them. Thus they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on one. Okay, we're going to come back to that. I missed one point i got to tell you about, and that's back in, in the beginning of chapter 5. I'm sorry, we're showing you a real quick, a real parallel that's drawn in Psalms. Chapter 5, verse 3. But Peter said to Ananias, remember this is the, two, the couple that gave of their property, but they held some things back, and they were struck dead. Okay, um, it says, but Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? To lie to the Holy Spirit. And then look down, verse for, okay, while it remained unsold, it did not remain your own, and after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, you have not lied to men, but to God. What's the parallel? Yeah, you've lied to the Holy Spirit, you've not lied to men, but to God. Okay, so there's a, just an apologetic standpoint when you're talking to your, your Jehovah's Witnesses, that's an awful one. Okay, that there's a revelation of who the Spirit is in the New Testament, and that Spirit is a very personal being that speaks, that, uh, that helps the faithful deliberate, and, um, and is actually divine. Okay, I think you might, from Catholic sense, but, well, of course, but... There is in the scriptures. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean. So, is why is it not enough to have to quote a personal relationship with Jesus, or are we supposed to have a personal relationship with the Trinity? We're supposed to have a personal relationship with the Trinity. <laughs> Absolutely. Just one. When we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, though, we are we are brought into a personal relationship with God Himself. With the, with the persons of the Trinity, because now incorporated into Christ, we stand in the place of the Word in the inner workings of God. So the Father gives His Spirit to us, okay, and we give ourselves back in love to God. And so all of a sudden, what took, takes place in God from all eternity, we are incorporated into that. We become truly sharers in God's own life. Okay. Now, back to uh, verse 12 through 16 there that we read. Um, verse 15. So that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and pallets, so that as Peter came by, at least a shadow might fall on some of them. This sounds like crazy talk. I mean, this guy is just a guy, right? I mean, can you imagine if we were taking out, like, the sick and, like, throwing them in front of the Pope? What, I mean, what the world would say to that? Or what some of our non-Catholic Christians might say to that? Well, you're taking away glory from Jesus and giving it to men. Is that the case? Is that what's taking place? Give me an example in the Old Testament where something similar took place, where at the hands of man or created things, material objects, man was healed. Give me some examples. Yeah, the serpent. Remember the bronze serpent? Okay. Becomes a source of healing for Israel in the desert. Okay. What else? Name in the pool. Name in the pool is cleansed by? By water, yeah. Exactly. What else? I didn't have that one in my notes. It's great. What else? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Look it up, Mom. Tell us about it. All right? I just 
my mind's not working on that right now. I think you're right. When else? When else? Mud. Okay, what about in the Old Testament, though? What about the bones of Elisha? Was it Elisha or Elijah? Oh, Elisha, right? When, when Elisha died and they were going to bury him, and all of a sudden a, a marauding band came, like, oh, it's a crazy story, but a marauding band came into the area and they all of a sudden they had to throw his bones in somebody else's tomb that had recently died. And what happened to the guy that was laying there dead in the tomb? All of a sudden he came to life because he touched the bones of a prophet, a holy man of God. If you wanted to write that down, you don't have to look it up right now, but that's in 2 Kings uh, chapter 13, verse 21. Similarly, in Acts chapter 19, we won't look at that, in Acts chapter 19, a pieces of the cloth that were touched to the apostles are brought and touched to sick people. Now not only are the apostles healing, but their clothes, no, not even their clothes, they're taking pieces of cloth and touching it to their clothes and then taking it out and touching people and they're being healed by it. What's going on? The shadow of the apostles? What's going on? Tell me. Carrie, tell me what's going on. God is giving them his check mark. <laughs> Well, they're not in school, and they're not in trouble. I know I used to get a lot of check marks when I got in trouble. What do you mean by check mark? Check mark. God, yeah. God is, um, is demonstrating his power through them as a sign that they are speaking the truth. Yeah, and I, I, I want to stress this point because notice it's created things that are now extending the immaterial life of God to mankind. Even the shadow of a holy man has powers to heal people. Okay? When we're talking about the Catholic Church and we're talking about the sacraments, this is why I told you that it's the key, that participation in is the key to Catholic theology. How is it that bread and wine can suddenly become the body and blood of Jesus Christ and, and somehow we receive divine life through it? Because God's plan is that all of creation is to be divinized, to be made to participate in his own life. That's uh, Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 21. Read it for us. Because the creature itself, or creation itself, shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Yeah. Remember in, the Genesis, in Genesis, in the beginning, man was to eat of the tree of life and... Live forever. You can look it up. You can look up later with him, Norma. Okay. Eat from the tree of life and live forever. This is God's plan, and it's not because we have crazy ideas about bread and wine and whatever. It's because God wants us to share in his life, and when we do, suddenly God's own life floods into creation. And all of creation begins to become, begins to become whatever, becomes the hand of God reaching out into the world. Even a tree or water. How is it that a baby can come out of water and we believe that suddenly they're participator in divine life? Because God made water so that it would share his own life with us. God made bread so that it would share his own life with us. God made trees so that they would share his own life with us. God made us so that we would share our own life with our fellow men. That's why creation exists. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I was going to say, um, yeah. you know, even I think about the saints, you know, there have been a lot of saints that um, because of their relationship with God, because of their faith, they have been healers and miracles have been connected to them. It's, it's, it's an ongoing thing yeah. from the ancient apostles, the apostles of 2,000 years ago and today. You know? Right. Yeah. And this brings up the point that Edmund and I were talking about we were, this Sunday about our class last time is how do you, when can you walk on water or when do you know how to talk to somebody and raise them from the dead? And I told you last week, I don't know. 
But it happens. When God wants to use you in that way, if you are ready, he'll use you. And as the evidence from the saints and from the scriptures tell us, all of a sudden, it's self-evident because we are doing what we've been made to do. And it doesn't just stop in the scriptures with these strange occurrences. It continues on in those that are living a life of holiness. And when you're living a life of holiness, suddenly, when God wants you to do something, you're going to do it. Because you've chosen to do it. Way beforehand. And then an occasion happens, and you act. And suddenly, miracles take place at the hands of men. Not at the hands of men, at the hands of dead bones of saints. How much more at the hands of living human beings? It's just that we're, unfortunately, oftentimes so spiritually impoverished that the dead bones of holy people are a lot better than our living hands. So when the church is functioning and healthy, miracles should be the norm. Not miracles should be the norm. The divine life, the heavenly life is the norm. So the miraculous becomes the normal. Yeah. These guys were freaking out like, oh my gosh, he just raised that guy from the dead. I can't believe it. It just happens. Yeah. It looks strange to people on the outside, but people that are living that life, it doesn't look strange at all because that's their life they're living. So do you think that it was more prevalent then than it is now because we have somehow failed in our modern day? Or do you think it was more prevalent then because they were just getting started and they needed there are, some divine signs? Yeah, there are certain graces God gives at certain times to help the church along difficult periods. And this is definitely one of them. You see in the midst of persecutions... What's that? This is, this is true. And that's why in the midst of persecutions, yeah. oftentimes you see mm-hmm. strange occurrences take place in the life of the church. But I would say I would say that it is happening in our own day, yep. all over the place, because every single day that you're receiving the Eucharist in there, a miracle is taking place at the hands of God if you have faith. And if the guy sitting there, while well, Peter looked at him and said, Stan doesn't have any faith, or Peter doesn't have any faith, it's not going to happen. Okay, but yeah, I mean, there's certain graces given in order for conversion to take place. You know, and so that can, you know, come and go with the times of the church. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you brought the story of Hezekiah. I did not. I um, happened to be looking when you were mentioning the um, Second Kings, and I just happened to, my eyes happened to just light on chapter 20. Uh-huh. Um, and I just found this really interesting because it just pertained exactly to what you're saying. And, um, go ahead, read it for us. In those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die, and you shall not recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I beg you, how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart, and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, Turn back and say to Hezekiah, the prince of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer and have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. And then at at the end it says, um, at this uh, verse it says, And Isaiah said, Bring a cake of figs. Right. And let them take and lay it on the boil that he may recover. Right. Yeah. So again, by the material, and what, well, just a side note, what uh, tree do we know was in paradise? Fig tree. And we know. Okay. Because they cover themselves in fig leaves. Okay. And he does the same thing with a cake too, I think. And there, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So what, again, it's created things which are becoming instruments of sal- salvation to man. How much more we are to be an instrument of salvation to our fellow men. Okay, we were just talking about sacramentals earlier. That's what sacramentals are all about. That's why we bless cars. We bless everything because our job is to make creation come alive with the life of God. Even a car. Okay? So we use, better move. We yeah. use oil and yeah. incense. Oh, yeah, and everything. We use all these Catholics. You love creation. You know? 
our bodies, we believe in the bodily resurrection, don't we? We say that, we never think about it. We believe in the resurrection of the body. That means our bodies in heaven, we're not going to be floating around like angels. I'm going to walk around and use my two eyes and use my nose. And I'm going to taste things on my tongue. And I'm going to see you guys, I hope. <laughs> I'm planning on getting there. <laughs> okay? Anyways. All right. We got, look, we're away. This is ridiculous. We got to, like, nothing. But it's good stuff. We got to keep going. Let's keep reading. I'm going to make a lot less comments. So, Nina, keep reading for us from verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 17. Acts? Yep. <laughs> Acts chapter 5, verse 17. Of course, we're in Acts. Okay, go. Go, Nina. Why, why the Sadducees? Because they were Sadducees. <laughs> What's that? Because of the resurrection. These guys are preaching the resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. We've talked about that before. We gotta cover some material, so go. to St. Paul when, he's, when, he is, when he is struck with the message of Christ. Okay, and so similarly here we see this guy kind of starting to come around a little bit maybe. Okay, go ahead. Did not stop 
teaching and proclaiming the Messiah Jesus. <coughs> why did they why did they rejoice at, at being flogged? I mean it, it sounds a little bit crazy, doesn't it? I mean Gosh. when's the last time you heard something like that? Yeah. I got whipped. Alright. It's strange. So why? Because Jesus flogged. Yeah, so, okay, great, so Jesus has been flogged, <laughs> no, I'm flogged, that's not very good. Why, Sue? No, you're right. Why? What, what about what Sue said is true? Because Jesus was flogged, they rejoiced in being flogged. Why? For the faith. Yeah, but... Well, it's that you're sharing. What's that, Sue? Sharing in his Whenever I ask you a question and answer that way, I'll never say no. Okay? Because they're sharing in his life. They see in themselves what's taking place, a participation in Christ's own life. Okay? I'll read you from Matthew chapter 10, just to save time, don't turn there. Behold, chapter 10, verse 16. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear testimony before them and to the Gentiles. When they deliver you up, do not be anxious of how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in, the, in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your Father who speaks through you. I think we could all meditate on that one for quite a while. Okay, when you're in the grocery store and that guy's standing next to you, don't freak out. Have faith in God. He'll speak through you. Don't worry about it. You're quiet, whatever. Invite somebody to the Bible study. Invite them to church. Don't worry about it. Just do it. The kingdom of God will not be accomplished without you. You've got to be willing to participate in it. To reach out your hand is the hand of Jesus Christ. Okay? Don't worry about what you're going to say. All right. Uh, let's go. Chapter 6, verse 1. This is ridiculous. We're supposed to get through chapter 9. No, no, Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Acts 6, 1. At that time, as the number of disciples continued to grow, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Who are the Hellenists? The Greeks. The Greeks, yeah. But what? Well, they're, they're, what, what they are most likely are Jews who were born outside of the Holy Land, outside of Jerusalem, outside of Palestine, were living out there and came back, okay, and now had established themselves in the Holy Land again. But they spoke Greek. They had Greek customs, as we're going to find out. They have synagogues where they read the scriptures in Greek. They have all sorts of backgrounds in their childhood, but they're, they're Jews. And they've converted and come to Jesus Christ, so they're Christian Jew Greeks, if you will, or something like that. Okay? Um, and they're living, they're established there in the Holy Land, and they've been established as Jews there. And now they're being converted. Some of them are coming to Christ, and there's all sorts of issues about how to deal with them. Remember at the beginning, as we're going to see as we keep going, at the beginning of the gospel, Jesus had said at the beginning of Acts, Jesus said right before the ascension, that you will preach in my name in Judea, in Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. And so now, it just even within Jerusalem, it's starting to spread to, to Hellenists, and pretty soon it's going to spread to the Samaritans, and pretty soon it's going to spread to the whole world. Okay, so there's these, these people, they are Jews, they follow all the Jewish practices, everything, but they speak Greek and they have certain Greek customs. Okay, go ahead and keep reading. So the twelve called together the community of the disciples and said, It is not right for us to neglect the word of God to serve at table. Brothers, select among, from among you seven reputable men, filled with the spirit and wisdom, whom we, whom we shall appoint to the task, whereas we shall devote ourselves. Stephen, a man filled with faith and the Holy Spirit, also Philip, 
Okay, so who are these guys? The first what? Yeah, maybe the first deacons, okay? They're actually not called deacons there. The word for sir is diaconia. Diaconia? Diacon... Sorry about that. Something like that. Um, and it simply means to serve. And so these seven are not called deacons, but they end up doing an activity which is very much like the deacons that we end up having in the church. Okay, so this is the first time that we can see this institution of, an, of apparently an office within the church of service. And they're not only to serve at table, but as we're going to find out pretty soon um, with Philip, with the deacon Philip, that they're also baptizing and preaching the word. Okay, so they're set apart to do a particular job within the church, and they're not just asked to do it, but the people elect them, and they say, they say these are men that are honorable among us, and then what happens? The apostles lay their hands upon them, and the laying on of, of hands in the, in the New Testament oftentimes has to do with healing, but it also has to do with the coming down of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we still see that today, the laying on of hands. Also, when else? The calling down of the Holy Spirit at Mass, when the priest places his hands over the Eucharist, called the Epiclesis, the calling down of the Holy Spirit, that placing his hands, by his hands, the power of the Holy Spirit comes down. Again, same issue, participation in divine life. They're handing on a particular aspect of their job and ordaining these men to a, to a particular job within the church. Okay? Um, also notice that it's not just that they're elected, but that the, they have to be called out by the apostles. So look at that, um, verse 3. Therefore, brethren, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer. So they're the ones appointing them to the duty, but it's the faithful who are bringing them up. That's the ancient practice of the church, that the lower, say the lower level of the hierarchy, if you will, offers up the one who is honored, the one to become a priest. The, the community would offer them to the bishop for ordination. The priests of a diocese would elect a man to be bishop. And the patriarch would ordain them bishop. Okay? You still see that practice in the election of the pope. The cardinals elect the pope. Well, who are the cardinals historically? What do you know what their historical origin is? They're priests of the diocese of Rome. If you go to the, the churches in Rome, all the parish churches will have at the front of their thing, Cardinal so-and-so, pastor of this church. Okay? They're the priests of the diocese of Rome electing their bishop. Okay? And it's God in that, in that situation that comes down and appoints him. They're offering this man as the one honored among them, as the, what do they say? Uh, full of the spirit and of wisdom, men of good repute. And that's all they're doing. They're saying, this is the one. This, this guy's the best among us. Here, take him. Okay? And that practice um, is still retained there in, in Rome. Okay, elected uh, bishop of Rome. has his own church. Yeah, it's called a titular, a titular see or titular parish. He's in name only. Okay, in name, some of these guys haven't been to the church, but it's just retaining that old practice of that's how they went about doing it. Okay. All right. What else? Notice these are Hellenists that are saying, "Wait a minute, we're the one. We're getting. Uh, we're not getting. Uh, our, our widows aren't being fed. What is this? It's not right." And so, who, is the, who are the ones that are chosen to do the work? Notice their names. Yeah, they're all Greek. Okay, they're all Greeks. And in fact, um, Stephen, as he goes and before, as, well, we're out of time, but I told, asked you guys to read all of Stephen's thing. How many people read it? Okay, not too many. we got one more week to do it. Read the next couple of chapters of Stephen's defense as he comes before the, before the tribunal, is arrested. And interestingly, all the references to the scriptures that he makes are references to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Okay? So he's using the scriptures that he knows from the synagogue that he's from. 
where they read the Greek text. Because, because they're, they do variant comparisons between the Hebrew text and the Greek text, and so they can find out for most, almost certainly what manuscripts they have that fit into what he's saying. Okay, so there's certain, there's certain uh, parts of Amos that are quoted that the way it's translated from the, from the uh, Greek text or from the Hebrew text, okay, it's unique to the Greek. Um, let me just, before we conclude, let me see if there's anything I have to say. No, okay. Read the story of Stephen then. I, like I said, we, we're going to conclude on November 6th. So we're going to keep it going for two more weeks after our, the set date there. We'll conclude this series on November 6th. So do me a favor. Read that section. If you don't read, I'm just up here preaching a bunch of nonsense at you and all that. Let me conclude with a quote from, if I can find it real quick, St. John Chrysostom. If I can find it. Oh, please. Oh, please. Ah, yes, I have it. We'll conclude with this. We'll, we'll use this as our prayer. You guys can remain seated. It's okay. He's talking about the Ethiopian eunuch who's riding in his chariot, reading the scriptures he's riding in his chariot. He says, Consider what a good thing it is not to neglect reading scripture, even when one is on a journey. Let those who reflect on this who do not even read the scriptures at home, and because they are with their wife, or are fighting in the army, or are very involved in family or other affairs, think that there is no particular need for them to make the effort to read the divine scriptures. The Ethiopian has something to teach us all. Those who have a family, members of an army, officials, in a word, all men and women too, particularly those women who are always at home, and all those who have chosen the monastic way of life, let all learn that no situation is an obstacle to reading the word of God. This is something one can do not only when one is alone at home, but also in the public square, or on a journey, in the company of others, or when, when engaged in one's occupation. Let us, not, let us not, I implore you, neglect the reading of the scriptures. So, we'll finish with that. Anyways, we've got to get some stuff done here. So, uh, chapter 6, verse 8. We just finished the introduction of these guys that are going to serve the church. And we might call the first deacons of the church. Um, and they're the laying on of hands. They're receiving the power, the grace of God. And in verse 8, verse Chapter 6, verse 8. Okay. Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 6, verse 8. Here we go. And Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Now, I'm not going to say a lot tonight. I'm going to try not to because I no, don't no, no, feel well, but also we've got to cover some ground. So here you go ahead. Then some of those who belong to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and others of those from Cilicia and Asia, stood up and argued with Stephen. What's it sound like? Jesus. Yeah, the trial of our Lord, right? They put out the same old nonsense. Okay, and so there's two attacks against him. First of all, that he speaks against the law and he speaks against the temple, right? And it's also bringing forward that, that repetition we've seen over and over again about the destruction of the temple, okay, being brought forth again. So, um, so Stephen's going to give an answer to them, okay, and. Uh, sorry, Carrie, I cut you off. Why don't you just finish the next couple verses there? And all who sat in the council looked intently at him, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked him, Are these things so? And Stephen replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. Okay, now he's going to launch into his whole thing, which you guys hopefully have read. His whole long tirade. Uh, tirade, whatever. What is it? What's he give? Salvation. He gives salvation history. Yeah, so close your Bibles. We're going to do it without Stephen real quick. We have a little fun here. Um, but before, before I... Come on, Carrie, close your Bible. And, uh, and um, I want to ask you, though, everyone saw his 
his face was like that of an angel. And yet, they end up doing what to him? Yeah, stoning him. How could they do that? If they saw his face was like that of an angel, wouldn't they just realize that, hey, they're on the wrong side of the game here? He looked like like an angel to them. Why not? To the only to the being looks scary. But he looks like an angel. Are angels scary? Well, they might not be seeing him with the same eyes as others are seeing. Ah, exactly. St. John Chrysostom, you're in good company. Says... because perhaps he had something to say, and in order that his very appearance would strike terror into them. For it is possible, very possible, for figures full of heavenly grace to be attractive to friendly eyes and terrifying to the eyes of the enemy. Okay? There's another uh, thought that um, I had when I, was, when I was reading that, that, you know, in the Garden of Eden... Eve goes and speaks with the serpent. We have to think, well, I mean, the book of Revelation, the serpent is described as a dragon. Well, why was she even willing to go and speak with the, with the devil? Unless he has the ability somehow to possibly change his appearance to make himself uh, attractive to some and make others terrified of him. Possibly Adam seen him in a way that Adam would have backed off and not intervened. Okay, and also similarly in our lives, I think that happens that, that the powers of darkness can be attractive to us. They are presented in a very attractive manner in some, sometimes to us. So we have that ability to, in the spiritual world to shift back and forth the appearance and the eyes of the one beholding has a lot to do with it. Who's seen it? Okay? As you were saying, it's possible that to those who didn't have the eyes of faith, seeing the face of an angel was actually terrifying to them. Okay? It wasn't something beautiful to behold. Okay, So he goes to this whole, he says, you want an answer? You want to understand what I'm preaching? Let me start in the beginning. And he works his way all through salvation history. Why would he do that? Because they, they are familiar. Well, they're familiar with it, but won't, don't you think they'd be like sitting there going, all right, yes, we know Moses, and we know so-and-so. Why would he do that? It's because he places Jesus Christ in the story of all of these Old Testament prophets. He just keeps right on going into Christ. So he begins in the beginning and starts building his momentum. And he says, look, it just keeps on going. And here's the next one. But we're going to look at some aspects of salvation history, the way he describes it, that really condemns the guys that are before him for rejecting Jesus Christ. But before we do that... Let's just do a quick salvation history tour so we don't have to read it. You tell me, what are the main, give me the main events of salvation history. The first major event of salvation history is? Abraham. Yeah, creation. Yeah, he goes with Abraham, but that's okay. Creation. What's next? All right, we can put the fall. Okay, we can put the fall in there. How? Abraham. Not, the, not that the fall's not important, but I mean, no, no, it's just the creation narrative, right? Creation, the fall's all the thing. Okay. Abraham is chosen by. Yeah, before Abraham, what? No. Yeah, Noah and the flood. Okay, what's next? That's better. Yeah, Abraham and um, what event in Abraham's life? Yeah, we just. I uh, the calling of Abraham. Okay, fine. What's next? Isaac. 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 All right. No, I mean, a major event in the Joseph. story. Joseph. Joseph. Okay, it's selling Joseph into slavery, the whole story of the Exodus, right? Which is part of that, selling him into slavery, the end of Genesis, the beginning of Exodus, and all that whole story. What's the next major event? Right? This can cover their going out and coming back in. What's the next? All the 40 years in the desert. Yeah, that's part of that. That's part of that. Come on, guys, you got to get past that. This is all stuff familiar to you, so we got to get into that question area now. What happens after the Exodus? The kingdom. Kingdoms. Yeah, okay, the time of the kings. Okay, the setting up of the kingdom, kingdom of David. What's next? What bad event? The birth of Jesus. 
Yeah, the Babylonian exile, and what event brings that on? Babylonian exile. What happened? What brings that about? What great sin among the people? Way before the Babylonian exile. Remember the civil war? The north and the south? The split in the Samaritan nation up north? Right, okay, so we have the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. Fine. And then you get the return from Baal, exile return, okay? And then what are we going to say next? Uh, maybe we'll just put Christ, coming to Christ. Okay, that's a huge bridge there, but that's okay. All right, and give me my people. And don't, I don't want you to see people talking here. Some of you other people that aren't talking. All right, Adam and Eve. Who's next? Noah. All right, fine, Noah. Who's next? Abraham. Isaac. Isaac. Jacob. Who's next? Joseph. Okay, are the 12 tribes, right? Who receives the uh, blessing? Of the, out of the 12 brothers. Judah. Judah. Right? And the line of Judah will become the line of the kings. Right? All right. <coughs> Moses. And who brings them into the promised land? Joshua. Joshua. Okay. Time of the kings. Well, you got, remember what happens in between the time of the kings and, the, and this? The judges. The, yeah, the judges. You get all those great judges. Right? And then finally, King. Who's the first king of Israel? Saul. Who's the first king of Israel, Carrie? David. Who's the first king of Israel? Saul. S A U T A L. Who's the first king of Israel? That's a question. God's the first king of Israel. Remember, and they asked for a king, and God says, "Don't worry, Samuel. They have rejected you as ruler over them. They rejected me as king. All right." So, okay, but all right, fine, David, okay. Okay, who's next? Solomon. Solomon's a very important, okay, Solomon, his son. Okay, who's the next major person you got to know? If, if any of you guys are lost right now, who's lost? Okay, don't admit it. All right. Uh, we're going to, right after Christmas, we're going to do our salvation history thing again, right? Just refresh our memories. So we're going to go through all this stuff. And we're going to go through a lot faster this time. You remember? All right, David and Solomon. And then, what major figure? Who's Solomon's son? Jeroboam. Not Jeroboam. Rehoboam. All right. Rehoboam. Rehoboam. Why is Rehoboam? Whatever. Why is Rehoboam important? Yeah, he's the one that causes the civil war to take place because he raises taxes and all that stuff. It's very hard on the people, right? Jeroboam takes the people up north. Rehoboam takes the people in the south, right? And two kingdoms are established. Eventually, who comes in from the north to destroy the northern kingdom? Assyrians. The Assyrians. And don't answer this next question. Who comes in to destroy the southern kingdom? So the Babylonians destroy the kingdom of Judah in the south where Jerusalem is, and they take them into exile. And then what nation rises to power? It's going to free them. The Persians. And what king among the Persians frees them? Cyrus. Cyrus. Writes the edict to free them. Okay? And fine. And who do we get in between these? What we get some 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 of the prophets. We also get Nehemiah and Ezra. Or Ezra and Nehemiah. And See, what, other, what other thing takes place? Remember, they're under the rulership of the Persians and then eventually under the rulership of the, of the Greeks, right? Remember that? The Greek Empire breaks apart. Stay with me. We're all done. And they're controlled by some bad guys after that split. Okay, or after the, after the Greek Empire breaks apart. And what dynasty rises to power among Israel? The Maccabees. The Maccabees. Okay, we'll just put Mac. The Maccabees. Okay, and it's after the Maccabees then that Christ comes, and then we get too much into that. So fine, there's salvation history. That's the whole Old Testament. Oh, we could have done that before we got salvation history series together, guys. So okay, open back up to Acts.
I want you to notice something about the way that, that um, St. Stephen interprets salvation history. Over and over again, if you look at chapter 7, he starts out, he starts telling the story, and he gets toward, in verse 9, he's talking about Abraham and the selling of Joseph. Says, and the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. Is that a good thing? Is that a good thing? No, not at all. Look at verse 27. Story of Moses. When Moses was was going to stand up for his people, he says in verse uh, 27, But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian. So, his own, so the people of Israel cast Moses out. Okay. Uh, again in verse 39. Again about Moses. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside. Okay. In the major parts of salvation history... Luke is writing about, and Stephen is talking about the major figures, the patriarchs of Israel, that when God sends people to them, they cast them aside. Okay? So they, they challenge Stephen and say, this man is blaspheming God, he's speaking against the law, and he's speaking against Moses. And what does he respond with? Our fathers were the ones. Do you want to talk about the people that spoke against Moses and spoke against the law? Those are our ancestors. Those are our fathers. The ones you hold up in honor, those are the ones that refuse to follow God, not me. Okay? Um, again, in verse, uh, in verse 53... In verse 53. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Okay, so he say they're, they're accusing him of not following the law. And what does he respond with? It's not me. It's you who received the law and don't keep it. Okay. Um, in verse 52, similarly, just one verse back. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Okay, so he says, you rejected the law, you rejected the prophets. And finally, continuing that same sentence, and they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. So, so he responds by saying, look, you people are accusing me of breaking the law. You broke the law. You don't follow the prophets. And you refuse Jesus Christ when God has sent you. You're the ones that are the murderers. You're the ones that are the killers. Far from backing down, he goes for their throat. And that's probably one of the reasons why he ends up getting stoned. Okay? So he responds. And not only that... He responds in a very interesting manner. He doesn't fully say, look, I haven't said anything about the temple. What's he say? What's he say about the temple? They accuse him. They say, look, you've been speaking against the temple. And what's his response? Verse 49, Nina. Verse 49. The heavens are my throne, the earth is my footstool. What kind of house can you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is to be my resting place? Did not my hand make all these things? Okay. So what's he say about the temple? He says, yeah. He says, look, God in the prophet Isaiah already told us that this thing you have built is ultimately not his final dwelling place. It's ultimately not his home. And that phrase there taken from Isaiah, um, <coughs> Uh, where is it? Oh, in verse 48, we skipped it, sorry. Yet the Most High the Most High does not dwell in houses made with hands. Okay, that phrase, made with hands, comes in the Old Testament three or four times, and it's always in reference to the making of an idol. Okay? And so he, in, in kind of veiled language, accuses those who have just built this temple of building an idol for themselves. And in fact, some ways, in some ways they have, in the way they're, they're treating it. 
Okay? So he kind of turns the whole argument on its head. Another aspect that we need to know is that as he goes through his response, as he tells the story of salvation history, he says, look, our people came from Mesopotamia. Who came from Mesopotamia? Abraham, right? And he goes up to Haran, and then he comes down from Haran. He says they came from Egypt. They came from the Red Sea. He points out all of these places outside of Israel where the people are being called from. Okay, And in fact, that's exactly what the early Christians are doing. They're taking in all of these people from outside of Judea and entering them into the house of God. Okay? We know he was divinely inspired, but would they have been shocked that Stephen knew this? They didn't know that he had the gift of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom and all that. No way. He known, known the salvation history from his background. Would, would they have been shocked to hear his knowledge? Oh, no, I don't think so. It's, it's warm in here. Well, no, it's, it's kicked on. Yeah, I know. It's probably it's kicked on. Uh, I don't think so because I think the question you're asking is like, we're kind of shocked that we would be expected to know that knowledge, right? Like, seriously, in among our group, for the most part, we're not totally confused by what I just did. And in most Catholic churches in the United States, people will be totally confused about what I just did. Really? Right? I mean, well, before we did our salvation history series, or before we were attending Bible studies all the time, talking about this on a constant basis. My, my point is, just, yeah. those apostles were fishermen, so they weren't the ones who were steeped in the, I wouldn't think they were steeped in the... I, I'd say maybe in the style of his response, he's able to stand before the judges and give a, give a cogent response. That might be true. But at the same time, these are men that are so dedicated to the, to the scriptures that they're able to quote him. Mean, he doesn't have a Bible in front of him, and he's quoting Isaiah, he's making references to Jeremiah, he he knows the scriptures at hand, and that is, he is inspired by God, you know, as you stand before judges, don't worry about what you're going to say, but at the same time, these people were able to do that. They were able to sit there, I hope even in our own lives, as we're studying the scriptures more and more together, that that's happening maybe even in your own life, that things are clicking in our daily lives that are making reference to the thing I'm reading in Acts of the Apostles, like, okay, this is... You know, and that's, I think, what's going on for him. He's been studying these things, and he realizes what's taking place before him. So, you know, I don't know if that's a... An odd question. Go ahead. Do you think that the people that the Jews in Israel now are Jews anyway are aware of the test and they're studying it like they used to? In the Old Testament, you mean? Sure. Well, I mean, no, there's a lot of secular Jews that aren't studying the scriptures. You know, there's a, there's, that's a huge thing. There's also a lot of very conservative Jews that are studying the Old Testament and know the scriptures very well. So, you know, we got to also realize that they weren't, they didn't have this in front of them, right? They were being told from their childhood. They were memorizing the text from childhood, handing that on. So memorization for the Jews was extremely important. Okay, um, but I'm not sure, did that answer your question? Okay, all right. Um, verse 51. What chapter are you in now? Oh, sorry, chapter 7. Chapter 7. Verse 51. First of all, he, what, he just quoted Isaiah. Okay, he just quoted Isaiah. And then he says, You stiff necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Okay, that uncircumcision of the heart comes from the prophet Jeremiah. Okay, in fact, we can turn there real quick. I'm not, I don't have a note that I'm supposed to turn there with you, but why not? Let's just take a look at it just in case. Um, Jeremiah chapter 9. Remember... Oh yeah, this is. A, I'm gonna. I'm glad I did it. Uh, remember, when you're reading these texts and you go to the footnotes of the Old Testament text, go back and at least read the paragraph. Right? It'd be extremely helpful. Verse 25, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 25. Shaven temples who live in the desert. For all these nations 
nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. Okay. So he he uses this reference from Jeremiah, and he also just quoted Isaiah against the people, against the rulers of Israel. And what's that mean? When is Jeremiah writing? Do you remember? Or when was Isaiah writing? What time period? Take a guess. Who who pasted my little thing in the back of their Bible? Did you, Nina? Sweet. Okay. Come on, take it. When did the prophets, when did most of the prophets come? During Judah. During the, during the break, right? During the Civil War. And just before or just during the time of the Babylonian exile, most of the prophets were preaching right at that time in the Babylonian exile. In fact, many of them went into exile with Israel and were writing during the exile itself. So let's read that thing again. Behold, the days are coming. Okay. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will punish all those who are circumcised, but yet uncircumcised. Egypt, Judah, Edom, the sons of Ammon, Moab, and all who dwell in the desert, that cut the corners of their hair, for all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. Stephen quotes this text and says, he was writing about you. You're the ones that are uncircumcised in heart. And guess what's going to happen to you? The Babylonian exile. A nation's going to come in and destroy you if you continue in your ways. By quoting Jeremiah and applying it to them, he applies the whole historical situation that's taking place. Okay? Go back to Acts. in the Old Testament and he turns right to the rulers, right to the people that are accusing him. This is what he says. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and nerves, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Okay, so he just goes for the jugular. I mean, of course, he's going to tell him, right? Now, when he heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth against him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of, the, of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Who else said that? Who else says something similar to that? Christ did. Yeah, what did he say? You see the heavens open in the Son of Man. Yeah. He did. See you the right hand of the Father, right? And when was it? Did he say that? He said it to Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Right, right, yeah. Didn't he say during his, during, his, uh, during the judgment too, in the temple? All right, so that the fall of Jerusalem. What's that? Did he say during the Anyways, so he has this he has this vision. What vision is it from the Old Testament? What vision is it? Look at your footnotes, it's right there. Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing right in the middle. There's quotation marks around it. Look down your footnote. Is it your footnote or not? No. Oh gee whiz. Oh, the worthless Bible. Turn to Daniel. It's a reference to Daniel, chapter 7. Daniel, chapter 7. Does some of yours have a footnote there? Yes, Daniel. Seven. Good. Daniel, chapter 7. I think this will be instructive for us that you guys got to go back. When you ever see a footnote, you got to go back and pause. Yeah, 
to Mark 14, which is where Christ is. You, and you watch. You go to Mark 14. I'll have a footnote to Daniel. But don't go to Mark 14 right now. Go to Daniel chapter 7. Go to Daniel chapter 7. Chapter 7. Here we go. You're there? All right. Verse 11. Daniel chapter 7, verse 11. Nina, go ahead. What's that sound like? Yeah, that's right, hey. Yeah. What's it? What other book of the Bible does that sound like? So, be Yeah, the book of Revelation. Because in the book of Revelation, John is making reference to Daniel. Okay. So, go ahead. As the visions during the night continued, I saw one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. When he reached the ancient one and was presented before him, he received dominion, glory, and kingship. Nations and peoples of every language serve him. His dominion is the everlasting dominion. Keep going. I, Daniel, found my spirit anguish within its sheath of flesh, and I was terrified by the visions of my mind. I approached one of those present and asked him what all this meant in truth. In answer, he made known to me the meaning of the things. These four great beasts stand for four kingdoms which shall arise on the earth. But the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingship to possess it forever and ever. Okay. So, reading that text in... And placing it in what's going on in Acts. Look back again at verse 13. I saw and behold the clouds in the heaven came. There was like this one like the Son of Man. That's the reference that he's saying. He looks up in the sky, he's the clouds part, right? And he sees one like the Son of Man in heaven. And he can't comes to the ancient of days, and what happens? He receives dominion. Who what kind of man receives dominion? The king. He's the Christ. Okay? Now we're gonna move he receives dominion and glory and, the, uh, and, and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Again, back to Acts and Pentecost. His dominion is everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. What's going to happen to the other kings? God. Their dominion, their kingship is being removed from them and it is being given to Christ and to his saints, to the holy ones. And so Saint Stephen is standing before them and he declares this vision of what he sees and the Jews know that when that takes place, the rulers that are ruling them on that day, not only the Jews, but he's standing before the, the rulers of the Jews, the Sanhedrin, out of their hands. They're the ones that are going to lose power. And it's going to be given to the holy ones. Okay? Not only is Jesus made king, but the kingdom is given to the holy ones. They are the ones given dominion. Okay? So go back to Acts again. Chapter 7, verse 57. Go ahead, Nina. Okay, there's a couple things that, um, a couple parallels. We started out looking at this whole situation with Stephen, and the accusations against him are a false witness, okay? A false witness about the destruction of the temple, similar to what, had we said? To Christ. Yeah. Yeah. The first one is predicting the end of the world, and the second one where he's being accused before 
Good. So it's the exact same situation, yeah. right? In the exact same time, he pulls. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay, it wasn't Nathaniel, right? Also Nathaniel. Oh, so it's also Nathaniel. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so that's nice. That's a point you go look that up at home. I mean, forget turning on the stupid television. There it is. I mean. <laughs> anyways. Okay, I'm gonna stop my. T- <laughs> It's just lately, I don't know. Um, you don't like television, right? I don't have one, so there's nothing to like. <laughs> okay. There's reports that Jesus will destroy the temple. Similar accusation, right? Jesus talks about the vision of the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Stephen has that vision. His prayer, which he offers to God. In fact, did we even get to that? Yeah, we got to that. Is there a parallel there between Christ and Stephen? Yep. What's the parallel? Yeah, it says, forgive them, Lord. They don't know what they're doing. So you see this parallel between Stephen and his Lord. And following upon what we've been talking about in Acts of the Apostles, what's going on? Maybe it's accidental, maybe Luke's just kind of trying to make it look kind of like, well, it's nice, it's like Jesus. What's going on there? We've been looking at all through Acts about what's taking place in the hearts of these men. They're being transformed into who? Into Christ. In their very lives, they're reliving the life of Christ. And here with Stephen, there is an absolute parallel, one after another, about the passion and death of our Lord and the passion and death of Stephen. Okay, They are being totally transformed into him. And what happens? Right away, Stephen's prayer is answered. Verse 60, chapter 7, verse 16. He knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was consenting to his death. Now we know who Saul's going to become. He's going to become Paul. He's going to go through a huge conversion very shortly. So immediately Saul's presented in the text because... Here's the answer to his prayers. His sin is not held against them. In fact, one of the ones that is murdering him is to become one of the greatest Christians ever to live. Okay? Let's keep reading, Nina. Verse 1, keep going. Okay, so we got that distinction between the region of Judea and Samaria. What's that? What, what's Judea and Samaria? What are they talking about? What's Samaria? What's Judea? Yeah, the north and south. Remember that kingdom was split in half in the Civil War. Okay, it's a good reason why you all you all have to do that thing again. The kingdom split in half, right? The northern kingdom became the kingdom of Samaria, and the southern kingdom the kingdom of, of Judea. So they're talking about the whole promised land. Okay, all right, keep going, Nina. Now those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Thus Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. Simon used to practice magic in the city and established the people 
Okay, so what's going on there? What can we learn from that text? First of all, they're baptized, and then what happens? And then they're confirmed, right? There seems to be this distinction in the gift of God between baptism and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Not only that, but who is the one that baptizes? Philip. He's the one that baptizes, and who's Philip? Not. He's one of the deacons, right? Stephen, he's one of the deacons among that group. So he goes down and baptizes, but in order to give them the gift of the Holy Spirit, he has to call for one of the bishops. He has to call for one of the apostles to give the sacrament of confirmation, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So right there we get that initial distinction in the sacraments that the church has always retained. Okay, that baptism and confirmation are two separate sacraments, although intimately related. Intimately related. Okay, in the early church, the distinction between baptism given when you're a child and confirmation given when you're older is, was never the case. Okay, the reason for it was a historical development from this very text. That confirmation was reserved to the bishop. And because the bishop couldn't come for every single baptism... They waited. And so they would baptize the child as an infant, and when the bishop came, he would re give them confirmation. Usually as a very young child. But unfortunately, that time period drew further and further apart, and the order of the sacraments, the ancient order of the sacraments, was, in a sense, turned on its head. So that now we get started giving baptism, right? And then, before the bishop could come and give confirmation, then we would give the Eucharist, and then we would confirm. Whereas the ancient order was always baptism, then confirmation, and then the Eucharist. Okay? And this idea of having to separate it by great many years is something foreign to the early church, and the Roman church is dealing with that right now. You'll see many of the writings of the Holy Father, and when this topic comes up among the bishops, there's always a consideration today about moving the years earlier and earlier for confirmation. What are we, why are we waiting so long? It's not a Christian bar mitzvah, right? Give them the graces as, as children. And you might say, well, what do they know? What do they know about confirmation? Well, there is, a, there is something church does it together, right? They do do it together, yeah. So I am a little biased here. But what do they know about confirmation? I'd say, well, what do we know about baptism? It's a sacrament of God. It's a mystery of God. And we stand with, in the, in the end, we stand with our hands open and say, Lord, I receive your graces. And that's about it. I mean, our all theology is helpful and things like that. But in the end, we stand before the mystery of God. Yes? I was confirmed two days after my first communion in New York. Yeah. They had it every four years. The bishop would come and started with said. Right. Seven to 11. Right. And then they would Right. Yeah, in the old, right, even probably some of you were kids, it was given at least like seven or eight years old, right? But today, I mean, California, you might, they wait till you absolutely will reject the faith, then they start your process of preparing you for confirmation, <laughs> right? So that nobody ever gets confirmed. Okay. That's a little side note for me. Um, and then we can go in verse 14. Now when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, and they might receive the Holy Spirit, for it had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, Give me also this power, that any one of, of whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. But don't worry, once saved, always saved. <laughs> Just kidding. That's not what it says. All right. Um, no. Uh, so the, uh, you know the sin of simony? Yeah. Selling church offices and church, church th and the, the, the grace of the Lord? That's where it comes from. Simony from Simon, who tried to buy the sacraments, buy the gifts of God. Okay? 
sorry, I had to throw that into one single <laughs> All right. Um, repent, therefore, verse 22. All right, Carrie, verse 22. Chapter 8? Yes. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that if possible the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness. Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may happen to you. Now, after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, proclaiming the good news to many villages of the Samaritans. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Canis, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Okay, verse 29. The Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah. And the prophet, uh, sorry, reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Of course I do. All I need is the Bible and the Bible alone. All right. I heard a third joke. You want to know? I got a joke. All right, I got a joke. I heard from my brother. And he, uh, he says, um, You know, they did, they did this uh, find the, um, the uh, they dug up Jericho. You know? They did. You heard that? They found Jericho. They dug up the, uh, what's it called? Yeah, the remains of the Jericho. They found out where it was. And um, they actually found one of the trumpets that Israel is used. But it only plays one note. It's an old, I guess, because the old in those days they didn't have all the different notes and stuff. What note do you think it plays? What do you think? B flat. Yeah, you've heard it before. B flat. Okay. I was gonna do that last night, but I didn't. It wouldn't. Okay. I'm not very good at talking jokes, but. understand what you were reading. And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture which he was reading was this, as a sheep led to the slaughter, a lamb before its shearer is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. In its humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken up from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom pray does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? It's the prophet Isaiah. Also, again, remember, context is essential. So going back to the context, the historical context in which Isaiah is writing, all of that, keep that in mind. Then Philip opened his mouth and began, and beginning with the scriptures, he told him the good news of, of Jesus. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What is to prevent my being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water. And Philip and the eunuch, the Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught up Philip, and the, uh, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at, at Aztus, and passing on, he preached the gospel to all the towns till he came. Caesarea. Just make one comment about that. Um, and that is that does the, does the Ethiopian unit call Philip to him and say, hey, can you help me interpret the text? What happens? He was sent to him, but look, go back. Verse, um, verse 26. But the angel of the Lord said, rise and go to the south of the road that goes to Jerusalem, to Gaza. This is the desert road. And he, re- he rose and went. And behold, an eat the open, a eunuch in the middle, and so on, and come to Jerusalem to worship, and was returning to the And he was reading the prophet Isaiah in verse 29. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, him, Do you understand what you're reading? Yeah, I think this is a good lesson for all of us because it's not like God's sitting there telling him, I mean, maybe he did, but I don't think so. Go up. See that guy? Go talk to him and ask him if he understands what he's reading. No. In the spirit, Philip goes, approaches the chariot, and offers the truth about Jesus Christ. 
In fact, I was just talking to a lady the other day that was, uh, she was in a parking lot, one of our people, she's not here tonight, she's in a parking lot, she saw a car and a lady that had the exact same car she did, but the lady had a cleaner car. So what'd she do? She walked up to the lady and said, said, I see you have the same car that I do. And the lady got out and said, yeah, you're right. She says, but you keep your car so much nicer than mine. And the lady says, oh, well, you know, no, I try to keep it clean, but I always fail. And then so our lady says, says well, you know what I think the most important thing is? That we keep clean our relationship with Jesus Christ. And this lady in the car says, you know, I've just been sitting here in this car, and I can't pray. I'm struggling in my life so much and I've been sitting here and I can't pray. And so she prayed with her. Okay? So what are, the, what are the opportunities given to us in our lives that we could just talk to somebody? Who cares what we say? I say stupid things all the time. Don't I? You guys know. You're talking all the time. But just, it's okay. Just do it. Okay, let the Spirit use you to do the work of the body of Christ. Okay, and you fail one time, try it again. You fail the next time, try it again. As I said to you, airplanes, fantastic. People can't get away from you. You can talk to them, right? The grocery store line, what are they going to switch lines on you? Just keep talking until they walk away. It's okay, right? Anything, little things, saying God bless you. You know, when you drive up, when you drive up to the um, to the toll road booth, how many times have you seen a guy sitting there that doesn't have any money? I see it all the time. I don't know. Do you guys take the toll? No. Okay. Well, that's a bust. But uh, no. The greenway, right? The green. Yeah, the toll road. The green. Yeah, and you're paying. The guy doesn't have any money. He's sitting there going, "Oh, what am I going to do now?" Give him some money and say, "Give glory to Jesus Christ," and drive away, and that's it. And that's all God wanted you to do that day. And you do that. Okay? Anyways. All right. Um, we can talk about some Old Testament stuff with, with the Ethiopian eunuch. But um, the, reason there, okay, the reason there is Jews that are down in Ethiopia or Ethiopian converts is because during the Babylonian exile, you can see this. We're not going to turn to it right now. But if you want to go look it up, um, look at... Um, uh, 2 Kings chapter 25. 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 26. 2 Kings 25, 26. Okay, and the little, read that whole, that whole chapter. Don't do it right now. Don't do it right now. Okay, because there's, some of the exiles are given a choice to go into exile in Babylon or to stay in the Holy Land. And they stay, some of them. And they end up leaving the Holy Land and going down why we find Jews even that far down uh, in Ethiopia. Okay? All right. Um, oh, perfect. This is fantastic. We're going to conclude with this. you got to give me five minutes. Because we're all late. Okay. Um, verse, let's just keep reading. You got baptized, right? We read that? We read the whole thing. Fantastic. Chapter 9, verse 1. Go ahead, Carrie. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him to let the letters specifically to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them down to Jerusalem. Okay. The one comment about that, the way, that's the reference in the early church before Christians were called Christians. chapter 40. We're not going to turn there right now. But it's a text that you know very well that John the Baptist used on the edge of the Jordan River. And what was that? What does John the Baptist say on the edge of the Jordan River? Pointing Isaiah. Make straight the way of the Lord. Make straight the way of the Lord. Okay, prepare a road through the desert, is what Isaiah says. It's the story of the return of the Babylonians from exile, not the Babylonians, the Jews, from the Babylonian exile to take the Holy Land back. Okay? And the early Christians understand themselves as the ones returning from the Babylonian exile, being given the kingdom back, finally. If you know, if you know the, the story well, after the Babylonian exile, 
Israel never really came back to life. It was always under domination. They considered them slaves in their own land. They considered themselves slaves in their own land. Okay? So still there was this yearning for this return from Babylon. And the early Christians see themselves fulfilling that. Okay? The way. All right. Uh, uh, so that it so that be found. Or verse 2. And asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he journeyed, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said to him, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. This conversion experience of St. Paul is a turning point not only in Acts, but a turning point in all of the New Testament writings that are going to happen. And it's become, it will become for us the root. When we study St. Paul after Christmas, this verse, this text, will become the root to understanding the theology of St. Paul. Because he has had a life-changing experience. Whatever he saw, Whatever he experienced was so life-changing that it would influence everything he did from this day forward. And what had just happened? Who was he persecuting? He was persecuting the Christians. He was persecuting Jesus Christ. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Persecuting me when you persecute them. And suddenly in the writings of St. Paul, we find something, a, a theology which is, I would say, foreign up until this point. A realization in St. Paul, not that it's foreign to what's taking place. We have just seen all this transformation of the people in the image and likeness of God. But suddenly, the understanding of what is happening to them comes to fruition. St. Paul has the vision of what is taking place. St. Paul has the vision of the body of Christ. St. Paul has the vision of Christians as Jesus Christ before him. Okay? I want to look, just in two minutes, I want to look at a couple of, of, of things. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5 real quick. These are all St. Paul's writings. Which one? <coughs> Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And honestly, this might, take, this might take more than two minutes. It might take three or four. So we got it. I understand. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> chapter 5, verse 21. Don't get upset with the whole talk about men and women for now. Let that go. So, so are we going? Ephesians chapter 5, uh-huh. verse 21. Subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands love their wives, should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ in the church. Okay, we've been talking about this in our study, this very verse. What's the great mystery? Christ in the church. And what is it about Christ in the church that's the great mystery? The union, the two shall become one. The two shall become one. The church is going to become Jesus Christ on earth. That is the mystical body of Christ. It is the mystical body of Christ. Okay? 
turn back to chapter 4. Chapter, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9. And we're going to finish with this one thing. We could look at other ones too, but we just don't have time. We'll start with it next time again, just as a reminder. Chapter 4, verse 9. Verse 9. First or 4? Ephesians chapter 4, <laughs> verse 9. Thank you. Chapter 4, verse 9. Here we go. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended in the lower parts of the earth? were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipment of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Notice the same language. Until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the cunning of men, by the, their craftiness and deceitful wiles. Rather, speaking in the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. From whom the whole body, this is the most important phrase, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint with which it is supplied, when each part is working properly, makes bodily growth, and upbuilds itself in love. Every joint with which it is supplied, that the parts of the body of Christ are not like, it's not like there's Jesus Christ as the head. Right here, and then we're all, well, I'm a part of it, so I'm hooked in like this, and you're like that, and you're like that. Not at all. St. Paul sees the body of Christ as a head with a real neck and arms and legs. And if I'm a leg, or if I'm a foot and my knee's not doing the job, guess where I'm going? To hell. Salvation depends upon the body of Christ, upon each one of us. If Philip had not walked up to the Ethiopian unit, he would not have been baptized. It is our job as the body of Christ to save our fellow men. I don't have a messianic complex or anything like that. It's just that Jesus Christ loves us so much that he doesn't save us by himself. He lets us save our fellow men with him. If we're willing. If we're willing. Our, our, our wives, our husbands, rely upon us for their salvation. Okay? Well, let's conclude in prayer. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. St. Luke. Pray for us. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sorry to be preaching to you guys. I was preaching.